I was sitting there the day that he started Inspiration Academy. Um, I am JR. I do multiple radio shows in lots of states. Um, and I first met, actually, I met Eddie only about 15 years ago. Um, and we had a mutual friend that was a guy who makes films, uh, Ryan Bodie. And we had this fantasy football league. So on Sundays, we would end up at Ryan Bodie's couch. And uh, I knew most of the people in the room, but I ended up on this couch um, sitting next to a guy that I had never seen before in my life. And, uh, you know, when you're a room full of people that you're comfortable with, there's one person that's like, okay, somebody's going to introduce us at some point, but nobody did. And we ended up getting to talk him because we, I like the Seahawks and he made a comment about Seahawks being his number two team. One thing led to another and um, it turns out we were both born in the same hospital in a tiny town an hour outside of Seattle, um, Harrison Memorial Hospital in Bremerton. And that's just, you don't run into people. Once you leave the Seattle area, you don't run into people from your hometown, let alone your hospital. So that was like instantly we're like, okay, we... Let's exchange numbers. Um, at that point, I had no clue that he had built a software company and sold it for millions and lived in a giant house. He had no clue that I had talked in front of two million people every day. You all of a sudden will find yourself with a lot of people who uh, are yes people, or they will say things that make you like, they want to be close to you, but it's not because of you, it's because of your work. Um, and I think people with money uh, or fame find the same things, where you'll you'll be surrounded by people who are there because you have money. And so I think Eddie and I probably became friends because we were two people who didn't care about the other situation. I didn't care that he had money, he didn't care what I did, what my job was, or how many listeners I had. And so instantly there was an honesty that was created where I could speak freely to him, he could speak freely to me, and we both weren't used to that. Um, and so that's where, and then when I started realizing just um, that this guy was in a place spiritually that I, as a lifelong Christian, had never been in. He was in a place where all he wanted was the presence of Christ in his life. So no matter where he went, it was always about furthering the kingdom of God, not becoming popular, not getting more money. And I, I just found that very, very refreshing. Um, <clears throat> Eddie actually hired me for one year to, uh, to be honest, he paid me for one year and I still don't think I did one thing. Like I can't think of one thing I did in that whole year that was a job I did. I think Eddie brought me on just kind of part time. So I'd leave the radio station two days a week, come to his house and we'd just sit and we'd brainstorm movie ideas, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I think he wanted me to be close to him because he knew that I would speak truth to him. Um, I had nothing to hide. He was potentially surrounded by people. Maybe he they would say what he wanted to hear and I just didn't have time for that. Um, and so I think he brought me on staff just to be a spiritual voice in his life, which I was more than willing to, to be that. But there was one day we were sitting at his, having our meeting, I don't know what we were meeting about, but um, I could tell he was really disheartened by his son was going to a very fancy academy that all the rich parents around the world brought their children to, to try to go pro at different sports. And um, But he was talking about how all the the kids, these elite athletes, they were all spiritually empty. And uh, including his son was going there and his son was having a hard time because there was no feeding into the soul. There was no feeding into the spirit. And classic Eddie just was like, well, how hard is it to start a school? And 11 years later, Inspiration Academy is impacting people's lives. But I was sitting right there. He's like, let's go change it. Let's go do something about it. I, I have some money in the bank. Uh, let's go do it. How hard can this be? And uh, I just, I love that I got to watch it birth right there in front of my face. Because Eddie likes to see something and then he's like, well, what do we got to do to go get it? And um, 
I also think being in politics is something I could never do because you have to not care what people think about you. Um, and he was born for this. I've been in some meetings where he's like, I want to acquire that movie because I think it'll change people's lives. How much do you want for that movie? You won't sell it to you. Every, just, I have been in some meetings where I thought to myself, I want to escape this room so bad right now because I'm so uncomfortable. And we walk out of whatever it was and Eddie is acting like, all right, want to go Cracker Barrel? Like it just doesn't, like, do you not know that that person was mad that you wanted to acquire their rights to their film? He goes, ah, oh, that'll be fine. Okay, my heart can't take too many more of these. But he was born to do this because I, when I think of people who actually make change in politics, they have this thick skin, this gall that I do not have, but they have to. And I look back in the Psalms and long after David threw a rock and slayed a giant as a, as a little boy, um, he ended up being the leader of Israel. And you read all throughout the Psalms and it's like all throughout the Psalms, David is constantly saying people are coming after him. They're trying to tear down his character. They're trying to destroy him as the leader of Israel. And, and David constantly was like, you deal with them. I will trust in the Lord, my God. And I think it's kind of the same when I look at, when Eddie first told me, he's like, hey, I'm gonna run for Congress. I'm like, you were born for this because you don't care about, you would rather go make change and do what's right than care what these people think of you. Just like David was leading Israel. And I'm like, there are certain people that were born to do this, that get things done because they don't live and die by what the majority thinks of them. Um, the years, uh, after I ended up working or can, whatever I was doing for Eddie for one year that I worked with him, um, he just wanted to get together. This is probably five years after I stopped working. Once he started the school, I was kind of no longer, um, just needed. We weren't doing the film stuff anymore. Um, and he called me one day and I kept, uh, we sat down at this coffee shop and I kept, I was like, what is this about? He's got some new he started the school, but now he's going to go start something else. And I was waiting to hear how I was going to be involved in it. Um, and I guess I'm kind of jaded because working on the radio, there's just a, a lot of times that people will come try to get you to be involved in something because you talk in front of a couple million people. And so you can never really fully trust people. And I guess that was the case. I hadn't seen Eddie in four or five years. And um, so I sit down at this table and I'm waiting for the big pitch. I'm waiting for him to say, how have you been, you know? Hey, I got this new, and it never came. It was Eddie just in a place spiritually where he wanted to um, see how I was doing. And it was very bizarre. He knew I had struggled through um, alcoholism and um, and uh, I've, I've always never tried to hide anything. Um, and I think he likes that about me and I like that about him as well. Um, and so just the fact that a guy who doesn't need another friend, you know, he's, he didn't need anything from me. It was essentially, hey, I've always valued you as a person. And it's been a few years, let's just sit and, and talk. And, uh, and that's exactly what it was. Um, and I was able to share everything with him and um, to get good biblical advice coming back at me with no agendas was uh, very refreshing. He's like the closest thing. When you read through the New Testament, you read about the disciples and after Jesus goes into heaven, these guys are kind of on their own now and they're, they're wild, they're crazy, they cannot be contained because they've touched the fire. And I, you know, you read through the book of Acts and all these things that they're writing in the Ephesians, Galatians, all this stuff. And they're out, the stuff that they're seeing is just crazy. It, it's like, oh, uh, they brought a guy back to life today. Um, you know, watched a kid get healed of blood, blood today. This whole village was saved today. These, these guys that knew Jesus for a little while, and then Jesus goes away. All of a sudden they're living these crazy adventures, doing things that most of us will never see or even hear about. 
but they were at such a level of faith that they were living extraordinary lives. And I tell Eddie all the time, I'm like, bro, you are the closest thing to a disciple that there is today because you are living such a faith life that common things a lot of us worry about just do not affect you because your heart is set upon advancing the kingdom of God and seeing God work in people's lives. But you're doing it with such faith that most of us never even get to go to those places or have those adventures because we a lot of times are stuck in these sort of average faith experiences. And Eddie's faith is, is at such a place it creates a ride um, that not all of us have the guts to go ride. And um, so I love hearing his stories of what God did now. Um, because when people have extraordinary faith, God does extraordinary things. And Eddie is right there for a front row seat for all that.